and we are live on Facebook. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to another New Jersey Constitutional Republican. I'm proud to introduce a man I've been waiting to have on this virtual conversation for many, many months, the distinguished Republican candidate for mayor of the great historical city of Atlantic City, Mr. Tom Forkin. Thank you, Tom, Thanks. for joining me. Thanks, JR, for having us. Well, it's great to uh, finally get together with you. As I said, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, As I, I want the people to know that you, I want, I want to know, I want the people to know that you are a proud Bridgeton Bulldog. Yeah, graduated Bridgeton. Actually, we just had our 40th reunion. Um, I can't believe it's been 40 years. 40th reunion at uh, the other night on, um, on Friday night. Oh, no, was it Friday or Saturday? Saturday night. I'm sorry. Saturday night. And uh, it was great. It's great catching it? up. Uh, over at the uh, Green Green was it Green Tree Country Club in Vineland. Green okay. Greenbrier, oh, Green the, Tree. The Greenville, the Greenville Inn at East Land probably was. That's it. That's the one. I knew it yeah, had something Greenville to do with Inn. green. <laughs> well, you know, we, we both graduated the same year. 1981, okay. except I was, I was a Shalik Cougar. And of course, you were a bulldog. And That's I right. know that uh, And before you give us a little bit of bio, I also want to tell the audience, of course, that you're a Villanova Wildcat as well. And that puts you way, yep. way up on the higher echelon of Michael <laughs> Testa and Michael Testa Sr. and Jr.'s uh, echelon of notoriety and, uh, and, uh, and heroics. So well, I'll, I'll congratulations tell you. on that. I love, love the test is actually our families have been friends for a very long time. Um, my father and their grandfather were dear friends. And um, my dad, um, as you know, was an attorney uh, in Camden County, Cherry, Cherry Hill area. Um, and his name was also Thomas Forkin. And, uh, you know, I, I believe his law partner, Pat McShane, was one of uh, Mike Testa's grandfather's law clerks. And um, mm -hmm. you know, my biggest mistake was I had an opportunity to clerk for Joe Testa and I didn't, you know, I, I thought I was going to stay in Pennsylvania. I'm like, I'm going to stay in Pennsylvania and work here. I'm not, I'm never coming back to New Jersey. And sure enough, here we are, you know, Jim Whalen gave me an offer. I couldn't refuse in Atlantic city in the solicitor's office. And I moved down here like 20, 25 years ago. So it's been a while. Well, it's, we're happy that we're happy that you did, and we're certainly happy that you're running for mayor of Atlantic City. But uh, Tom, give us a little bit of a bio about yourself <clears throat> for those who may not be as familiar with you as I am. Well, you know, my name is Tom Fork, and I'm running for mayor of Atlantic City. Um, as Jar said, uh, I, I am a Bridgeton High School graduate. Graduated Bridgeton in 1981. Um, I went on to attend Villanova University, Villanova Law School. Um, I gra after graduating law school, I was in private practice for a while. I had offices in Philadelphia and Stone Harbor, I, and I practiced. I had an office in Bridgeton for a while, um, and then I got an offer at the uh, from Jim, Jim Whalen uh, to work in his administration as a uh, city solicitor. Um, and you know, for my first period there, uh, first year or so, I worked as the police legal advisor. Um, I rewrote the rules and regulations for the Atlantic City Police Department. We created the office of, or, you know, the, the position of lieutenant and, um, you know, some other uh, zero tolerance type of policies there towards racial discrimination and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was successful. We, we, I was also part of the legal team that developed uh, Atlantic City, the walk, uh, the tunnel, the convention center, the H track back where uh, Borgata is. And um, yeah, it used to be the city dump in the tow yard. You know, Jim, Jim would give us stuff and he's like, Tom, here's what I want to do. Just make it legal. You know, so we had to develop a, a legal opinion to support his position on developing certain things. Um, and, you know, much of the town was developed. That was something that we raised with the AFL CIO this evening, um, you know, in seeking union support, which, you know, we do do um, because, you know, campaigns need union support and uh many times it goes to the democrats because you know they're making promises that they can't keep but you know the bottom line is and, and as i said this at our meeting this evening that um you know some people are big on promises short on delivery i'd rather 
you know, under promise and over deliver than, um, you know, than, uh, you know, over promise and under deliver. But, you know, getting back to, to my credentials, I also uh, served as in-house counsel for APG International. We we did all the architectural gla glass at the uh, Ocean Casino, which was formerly the Revel, uh, the new Borgata Tower, and a good amount of the construction, the glazing construction at um, at Harris. So, you know, that's the experience, you know, that I had about 10 years ago. I returned to teaching. Um, I teach at ACIT. I'm an educator there. I teach U.S. history, constitutional law, and world history and a financial literacy course. So, you know, I love teaching. I love my teaching career. I didn't have a burning desire to run for mayor of Atlantic City. But the way things are going sideways, I think, you know, and I teach my students this when they ask about it. I don't, really don't talk about my mayoral candidacy at school. I don't skip school to go campaign, but I tell them that it's a lesson in civics, you know, because if you want to protect the process, the only way to protect the process is to participate in the process. You know, we have to participate. We have to be active citizens, you know, voicing concerns and, you know, uh, getting out the vote to vote for the proper candidates. I mean, the way the state's being run into the ground by this Murphy debacle. I mean, you know, the old joke, well, it's Murphy's law. Well, this is really literally Murphy's law, which breaches the constitution right. in a variety of fronts. And there really needs to be a, a, a sense of outrage amongst New Jersey residents. I mishandled the pandemic and, and from soup to nuts during his administration, it's been a train wreck. It's been a dumpster fire, whatever you want to call it. You know, Murphy's got to go and his minions, they also need to, to go the way of being voted out November 2nd. That's right. And Tom, what makes me so enthused about your campaign is the fact that you are an educator, you are a teacher, and the citizens need to be taught by their representatives. Uh, we talk about civics. Well, our organization's involved with educating the people on civics. Civics, most people don't understand, or is knowing their rights. Civics is all about yeah. knowing the individual citizens' rights and then their responsibility of being a good citizen within their society. And that has yeah. been completely forgotten, completely brushed aside, but you've been teaching and you've been talking about it. And then the Constitution, the Constitution is what protects our natural rights. It's not going to be up to the representative as much as the representative adhering to the Constitution, uh, fulfilling the oath and taking the uh, sworn oath to defend and support the Constitution. And that's precisely what you will do for the people of Atlantic City. Well, uh, you know, the, the problem, and it's not just endemic in Atlantic City, but it's endemic really across the state and across the country. People don't understand That's their right. fundamental rights, the fundamental freedoms that the Constitution affords us. And, you know, when I teach the Constitution to my students and, you know, we get into, you know, the Republican Party being the party of civil rights. And, you know, because Martin Luther King was a Republican, Frederick Douglass was a Republican, um, you know, Malcolm X was a Republican. I mean, the, you know, Booker T. Washington. Our first, our first uh, African American mayor of Atlantic City, James Usry, was a Republican, and somewhere along the line, and I, I've, you know, listened to a very interesting radio show in D.C. on my way down to see my son in Virginia, that, um, you know, they were discussing it was an African American conservative radio show, and they talked about, you know, following the signing of the Civil Rights Act, you know, back in 1968, which extended you know, the original Civil Rights Act that was implemented by the Republicans and that MLK uh, lobbied for, for JFK, and eventually, as we know, uh, Johnson signed it. But, you know, that was kind of like the transition where, you know, the Democrats went out and actively um, solicited, um, you know, African-American support and other minority support. And then, you know, they throttle this, this welfare state upon people and they become you know, dependent on the government for, for income and they deny them opportunities and then they turn around and wag their finger at the Republicans and blame them. But if you look at mm -hmm. um, our candidates this evening, we have a very uh, diverse and dynamic um, ticket, you know, in District 1 and District 2. Um, you know, we have African Americans, we have South Asians. I mean, our first uh, African American legislator in South Jersey Antoine McClellan is a dear friend of mine. And it's not about one's melanation. It's about one's mindset. 
You know, it's about their education and their their acumen towards affording people, you know, their inalienable rights that sometimes folks just go, go along to get along and they don't really want to rock the boat. Um, but, you know, if you don't rock the boat, you're not going to get the rats off the boat, you know. And one of the reasons that we created the New Jersey Constitution for Republicans, Tom, was because we wanted to reintroduce to Republicans and then the rest of the voters, whether they're Democrat or independents, that we are truly the party of emancipation. We are the party yep. that ended slavery. We fought a war. We lost 350,000 approximately men and women who died to uh, fulfill the initial pr promises and principles of the Declaration of Independence, the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. And this is why we are bringing back into the memory, and well, many people have never heard of Thaddeus Stevens or Charles Sumner yeah. or all of the great, the great, and Thaddeus Stevens was such an important man in carrying on Lincoln's legacy and he had to deal with an Andrew Johnson who was wanted to thrust us right back into the slave power. And this is well, really where Reconstruction began to go wrong. But we want to resurrect Thaddeus Stevens and his fire and his determination that all men are to created equal and the equal application of the law must be given to everyone indiscriminately. Well, well, people forget that Andrew Johnson was a Democrat, you know, uh, Lincoln sought to placate the Southern Democrats and, and create unity and afford an opportunity to, to Andrew Johnson to become vice president, because back then vice presidents, ah, they didn't do much, you know, it was kind of like just right. something, uh, well, nobody's going to assassinate the president, come on. So he gave him this job. And uh, tragically, Lincoln was assassinated. And Andrew Johnson, a Democrat, becomes president of the United States. After he becomes president of the United States, he, he allows the um, Southern Confederates to be released from prison for treason. They were released. Hmm. Not only did he allow them to be released, he allowed them to participate in the electoral process. So, you know, in, you know, in that transitionary period, and I, I, when I teach my students this, you you know, you had over 1,500 elected African-American officials in the South, basically running the South. I mean, nobody can mention, I mean, you, you probably know this, but if anybody out there can think about it for a second, who was your only African-American Speaker of the House in Washington for a period of almost 12 years? Your only African-American ever to be Speaker of the House was John Rainey, an African-American Republican. OK, from South Carolina. So when you think about, you know, how they've restructured the narrative and I think that, you know, us as Republicans have waited. And this is what's great about your show is that people forget history, you know, and we've allowed um, our, our friends on the other side of the aisle to restructure history and to, to wag their fingers and to call, you know, to point the race card at us when they're losing an argument or something like that. And it just doesn't work. Look who's running for governor in California. You know, you have elder in California, you know, he's going to be your, your next governor of California, you know, That's look dope. at who's running for governor in Texas, you know? So their argument is, is disappearing pretty quick. And I think with the Blexit movement um, and, uh, you know, they're going to be they're going to be hard pressed to continue that narrative as, as time moves on. And hopefully it develops this election cycle. That's right. And we talked to uh, Mike Zach, who's a good friend of ours, who wrote a book called mm -hmm. Back to the Basics for the Republican Party. And he comes up, uh, he came up with a very significant mm -hmm. quote. He says, the more the Republicans know about the history of their party, the more yeah. the Democrats are going to be in fear for the future of their party. And that's why we want to get that word out. Uh, we want to get that Republican, initial Republican principle message out. And you're doing that in Atlantic City. Now, how is the message uh, being uh, received in Atlantic City, in the urban areas in downtown Atlantic City? How's, your, how's the message being received of your candidacy? Well, well, you know, I, I've lived in Atlantic City most of my adult life. And, um, you know, we have a number on both sides of the aisle. Um, I think that the, the message has resonated. Several years ago, I developed the federal civil rights lawsuit. And uh, this is before, you know, I've only, 
I haven't been a lifelong Republican. I was a lifelong Democrat first, but like Jeff Van Drew articulated, you know, we didn't leave the party. The party left us. And when you look at core values and moderate individuals, and I'd like to consider myself mm-hmm. a pretty middle of the road kind of guy. Um, you know, I, I understand right. arguments on both sides, but seeing how far left that the Democrat party has swung, you know, about, you know, four years ago, I, I was an independent uh, for, a number of years and then um i gravitated gradually over to, before i ever thought about running for office was to become a republican because i believe my core values align with the republican party more so mm-hmm. than than the democrat party so you know with that said you know my proposal is to move uh, against the state of new jersey on civil rights grounds because you know a civil rights a 19 a, if you look it up united states code annotated which kind of you know, articulates the legislative intent of the Constitution is that, you know, a law doesn't have to have the prejudicial intent. It just needs a prejudicial effect. And as you read that, that article, that, that, uh, that uh, statutory code and the legal Mm -hmm. progeny that kind of springs from that, you'll see that it's Mm -hmm. well supported, well grounded that, you know, to be unconstitutional, to be a civil rights action, that it needs mm-hmm. to have that prejudicial effect. Now in Atlantic City, what do you have? You have a state takeover, you know, uh, yep. and you know, I didn't always agree with Chris Christie. He did some good things and I can circle back, or I shouldn't say circle back, right? Uh, I'll come back to that uh, in a little <laughs> bit. But, um, uh, you know, when you look at what the state takeover has done, they said that Atlantic City was being fiscally irresponsible. Now, while I wasn't part of that administration, that the city was $100 million in debt. And that is the rational basis that the state used to come in and take over Atlantic City. $100 million. That's a lot of money for a municipality, right? So, but those budgets were approved by the Department of Community Affairs. I'll run that by the DCA is a state agency. So the DCA approved those budgets so they helped create the $100 million. Now, since really? the Murphy administration took over Atlantic City's finances, our debt is not $100 million anymore. It's $550 plus million. Unbelievable. And, and, and then they expanded. And Tom, it's like one of the Zip Wait, there's just, more. Let me, interject very, let me just interject very quickly. How can Trenton, how can the state, which is over $220 billion in debt, expect to come down and straighten out the financial situation in Atlantic City? It's the Listen, epitome of hypocrisy. That's that's like hiring. I mean, when the state came in and I said this early on, it's going to be a train wreck. You know, this is like hiring a pyromaniac, you know, to become a fireman. <laughs> You know, these guys, they couldn't get their hands on the money fast enough. And, you know, it, and it, it just keeps hemorrhaging out of Atlantic City. When you look mm. at the legislation that they have in place now, you know, we're $550 million in debt. And somehow, you know, these junk bonds, these, these things that they float and they try to work the numbers that our bond rating in, in increase. Yeah, the bond rating got better because the finances for the casinos have stabilized. But getting back to the civil rights action, you know, the prejudicial mm-hmm. effect of the pilot law, which we can talk about in a minute, and, and the state right. taking our bleedingness of our tax resources, we have people being taxed out of their homes, senior citizens that are on fixed income from their retirement that they saved up for for many years so they could live off of a fixed budget. They know what their mortgage is. They know what the taxes are going to be, relatively speaking, and that they're going to be able to remain in their house. They saved up all their lives to buy, and they're being taxed out of their homes as we speak. Mm -hmm. That's egregious. The vast majority of those individuals are are members of our community who happen to be African-American. And those Mm -hmm. are the individuals that are being taxed out of their homes. And who's buying those homes? People that want to open Airbnbs, you know, so the Mm -hmm. Airbnbs come in, they buy them up. And then some of the other neighbors complain about the Airbnbs or being too many. So then, you know, Marty Small, my opponent, comes up with this genius idea. Instead of like $800 registration fee for an Airbnb, because they were complaining about the noise Mm -hmm. in some of the Airbnbs, we're going to increase that fee to $2,500 a year. So it's just everything is just playing, you know, to just 
you know, to, to the special interests. And when you look at the amount of, of money that the state takes, 100% of the luxury room and parking tax, JR, 100% of the luxury yep. room and parking tax, that's tantamount to 90 plus million a year because all the concerts mm. that we have, all the room rates, like yep. if you go to Atlantic City, um, you'll see that there's a luxury tax attached to everything. 100% of that goes to the state. The room tax, 100% of it goes to the state. It's like, it's um, yeah, yeah, you feel like Bill Murray in Caddyshack. You know, you know when you yeah. see Caddyshack, right? You, you golf a little bit, and Bill Murray's caddying for the Dalai Lama, and the Lama tries to stiff him. He's like, hey, Lama, how about a little something for the effort? And the Lama goes, on your deathbed, you should have total enlightenment. So he got that going for me. I mean, these guys, you know, the state of New Jersey has been peeing on the residents of Atlantic City, tell them that it's rained for like the last 40 years and it's got to yeah. stop. And on top of it all, Tom, for the first time in the history of our nation, in the state of New Jersey, the constitutional rights <laughs> of freedom of assembly, religious expression, and the right for the people to obtain, possess, and secure their property which is their money and their business, were all suspended in the guise, false guise of public health emergency that was completely mismanaged and completely, uh, as we say, the suspension of the constitutional rights. So they caused this economic catastrophe on top of everything else with Atlantic City being shut down. Yeah, nothing like shutting you down for a virus with a, you know, with a 1% one, one fatality rate. I mean, if you had a heart problem, you know, and you died and you had the COVID virus in you, it was COVID. You know, it, it's it's oh, tragic. Yeah. I mean, I lost four friends with the COVID virus and it, it was tragic, you know, um, but you still can't get a straight answer. You know, but all these these folks that, you know, they couldn't go. Nobody apparently died of AIDS or cancer or anything else. Everybody was dying of COVID. You know, I had friends of mine, several of them that died of cancer we couldn't get in to see him in the hospital, you know, Tragic. Um, and, Tragic. and senior citizens, you know, their children couldn't go and comfort them in, in the nursing homes. And then Murphy sends infected people back into the nursing homes. I mean, right. you know, what, what's occurred. It was, all and, because, and it was all Tom. It was all because they thought they were going to run out of beds, which they were completely miscalculated. Uh, yeah. There was no issues with getting people into um, into hospitals and then sending the people that are infected in the convalescent centers. Now, let me ask you a question, Tom. Did the people of Atlantic City realize the egregious deprivation of natural rights that occurred with the suspending of the Constitution? Did they understand the enormity of what Phil Murphy and the Democrats have done in the state of New Jersey? Well, you know, we've been trying to educate them in that regard. I, I think, you know, many people in Atlantic City don't understand it. I think people across South Jersey and frankly across New Jersey don't understand it, especially in North Jersey, because I think that yes. if they understood that, you know, reelecting Murphy wouldn't even be an issue. But the way he's treated, trampled on the con our constitutional rights, you know, requiring masks. I mean, here's an example. You know, like I said, no luxury, a luxury room and parking tax, 100 percent goes to the state of New Jersey. We had fish come down for three days in Atlantic City. Right. The, the, the group fish. It's like a big musical group. Hundred thousand people elbow to sure. elbow on the beach every single night for three nights. OK, all that tax revenue went right to the state. Murphy didn't try to shut that down. But yet we have to have our children and our you know, I'm, I'm an educator. I have to wear a mask every day. Um, but yet you, know, you have hundreds of thousands of people on the beach in Atlantic City elbow to elbow. And I haven't heard any increased cases as a result of that. Maybe that's something. I don't know. I think right. that, you know, this thing's been overplayed. I think that the Democrats yep. used the virus, you know, as a scare tactic. You know, obviously, it's not the first pandemic that we've experienced, um, you know, in our, in our, you know, civilization. Um, and unfortunately it won't be the last, but I think there's no better um, remedy for that than our immune system. And I think your yes. immune system, you know, if anything we learn from this is to take better care of ourselves, you know, to work out more, to take That's more right. vitamins, to eat healthier, maybe to, you know, to do, to treat our bodies better. Um, you know, but, right. uh, yeah, hopefully people Absolutely. in Atlantic City and across the state wake up and figure that out because, you know, to shut businesses down like they did, to run small yeah. mom and pop businesses. I, I know businesses that didn't reopen, JR. 
Terrible. Terrible. Thirty percent of small businesses done. Yeah. Yep. And and you know, electing now, now Jack Chitterelli is gonna is gonna fix that. You know, it's it's gonna close the door in that type of nonsense that Murphy, you know, uses to to his benefit. And you know, the most egregious thing, and, and I, I'm sure you're following this in the news, that he had, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in federal aid that was released to the yep. states. Now all of a sudden he's releasing it, running into an election cycle to basically purchase votes and coddle favor. And he's given it to his friends that are Democrat mayors. I know he gave Marty Small some money and Marty is going to give that out to individuals that are in his circle um, to help him get his vote out. I mean, sure. that's a violation sure. of the Hatch Act, in my opinion. That's right. And also, uh, uh, Tom, what he's done is with the $500 tax rebate, you would have never seen that tax rebate unless he was coming up a couple of months before election. He never would have done that. Everything he does is for political expedience and power. And he probably wouldn't have uh, opened up the economy or opened up again if he wasn't in an election year either. If it was yeah. still a year away, I guarantee we'd still be in lockdown at this time. I, now let I, me ask you a question: right. Is pilot is 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 pilot? Explain to the people what pilot is. But is pilot in effect until twenty twenty five? Well, yeah, and you know, I had a nice conversation with Denny Levinson not long ago about, and the pilot is an acronym for payment in lieu of taxes. The casino pilot right. is payment in lieu of taxes. Now, what that's due to is that the casinos, you know, they were winning many of their tax appeals and, you know, because the uh, their contention was that the city tax assessor was um, over assessing their properties. So in order mm. for them, in, in, in their opinion, to stay in business, that they needed something like this, you know, a payment in lieu of taxes for a set period of time. So they were extended that by the state legislature that's in, in play until 2025. But, you know, the problem with that is, is the near constitutionality. I know that Denny Levinson and yeah. the County of Atlantic, they challenged that on constitutional grounds. And I believe if it was adjudicated, they would have been successful. Atlantic City, mm -hmm. I went to city council and begged Atlantic City to join the suit. They did not. The case was settled you know, because the state didn't want any part of that, because if you settle mm -hmm. a case, you think you're going to lose. So mm -hmm. they settled it. The county got a lump sum of money. Atlantic City wasn't part of the suit. So Atlantic City didn't get part of the settlement. That's their problem, mm -hmm. right? And and yeah. that's our leadership's problem for not understanding the gravity of what's going on. I mean, they just need better attorneys in, in the solicitor's office, I think, you know, than understand the Constitution. Um, right. But uh, and, and in, yeah, and in so, listening to the conversation, and also Tom, listening to our conversation, you know, the money that is generated from the taxes, of course, is all going back to the state, and it hurts the city of Atlantic City that needs that money. You and the township or, or the city council, you're the ones who are best equipped to take care of that money. Uh, you live there. Everyone lives there. Everyone has a, a, a stake interest in Atlantic City. And yet well, you, up in you Trenton think, is where all the money's going. You, you would think that everybody lives in Atlantic City. Now, getting back to my original move to Atlantic City, there's a city ordinance that says to be you know, part of the administration, to be a director, what have you, you have to live in Atlantic City. That's mm -hmm. why I moved there, because you had to live there. You still, that ordinance right. is still in the books. Do you know, out of like the 12 directors that we have in Atlantic City, that only one director lives in Atlantic City? Only one. Scott Evans, the fire chief. Everybody else lives out of town. Our city solicitor lives in Linwood. Our uh, director of licenses and inspection lives in Millville, Cumberland County. Our director of planning and development lives in Tuckerton, Ocean County. I mean... You know, we can't even enforce our own ordinances, but these folks don't have any skin in the game, Jr. They, they're not citizens. Yes. They don't like they go back to Ocean County. They go back to Cumberland County. They go back to Linwood or Ocean City, Cape May County. They don't even live in the city. Yeah. And we have a city ordinance on the books. Hey, listen, hire them. If you're going to hire them out of town, have them move to town after the fact. But to have yeah. people that live not even in the county, they don't get it. You know, they're they're and they all got raises. 
You know, the state bought them off. The state gave, you know, Marty Small a $41,000 a year raise for doing what? You know, for increasing everybody's taxes two or three fold. And then he gave yeah. his minions in just in his office, in his inner circle, a half a million dollars a year. That's 500 plus thousand dollars that they got annually that comes out of tax money. So if the state wants to start chirping about fiscal responsibility and using their constitutional right, I think that that's kind of a double standard, don't you, Jr.? Yes, I agree. Tom. <laughs> it's, it's, um, you know, that's the Democrats One of the things that. that you'll do is the mayor. One of the things you'll do as mayor is to make sure that that ordinance is enforced and that you have people who live oh, yeah. in Atlantic City and are intimately involved with it and understand the circumstances there. They are the ones who are running the local government. Yeah. Atlantic City needs to be brought back to the people that, that live there. And that's what you're trying to do. And your candidacy will fulfill with, with your victory. Well, we, we can hope. And again, I tell people all the time, it's not about me winning. You know, it's about the community winning as a whole. I mean, when you look at what's going on in the schools, the state takeover has decimated the public school system in Atlantic City. The public school system in Atlantic City is one of the main reasons that families left Atlantic City in the first place. You know, you have mm -hmm. a school budget. The school budget's bigger than the city budget now. The city budget's 250 some million dollars. The school budget's close to 300 million. And you have a mm -hmm. superintendent, you know, under the state monitor. He's not even a certified teacher. He never taught a class in his life. How can you actually have a superintendent of schools that is not a certified teacher, that is doesn't have a doctor in education, never taught a course? When I ran for school board a few years back, you know, I questioned that and I called the State Department of Education and asked them. But the language in the statute reads in the administrative code reads that they have to have four years in education. He was the grounds and, and bus director. And somehow that counted for four years in education. I'm like, you know, you folks really need to get your head out of your ass and, mm -hmm. and start applying the law pursuant to the legislative intent. That was intended to be, you know, a teacher of four years, not, you know, in education means actually teaching a class, not coordinating buses right. and cutting lawns. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, when you look at what's going on with the school board in Atlantic City, you know, it's a travesty. They cut out the kids' middle school programs all the middle school sports programs. And I was teaching in the district at the time. And, you know, I railed against it. I wasn't running for office then, but I was upset because I knew living in Atlantic City and my son was saying, if you don't keep teenagers occupied, especially like, you know, seventh and eighth grade, you know, just that pre that preteen thing, that they're going to gravitate to bad behavior and they need the structure of an athletic program, you know, to guide them, to teach them goal setting and to teach them really, you know, to pursue their passions if it's sports or, or what have you. There's a lot of life lessons there, but they cut the programs anyway. What do we have? Children in Atlantic City have gravitated to gangs and bad behavior and, you know, I stood up at the last school board meeting, not the last one, but a couple school board meetings ago. And I, I said, I told you so, you know, we're failing our children as, as, as a city, as a school board, and we're failing our seniors that are, you know, retired. And, and, and that just can't go on. I mean, you know, we need change in Atlantic city, Atlantic County, and frankly, the state of New Jersey as well. That's right. And Tom, uh, what your candidacy offers of course, Atlantic City is notorious. We've had series made about the Nuki Johnson, and we've had all sorts of history of the corruption that has existed in Atlantic City for so long. But your candidacy, your candidacy for mayor really represents a truly clean slate. And not only to go along with the clean slate, here is a man who has constitutional literacy and some intellectual rigor, which to me are the two prerequisites for anybody who wants to be a representative. Now, how do we get that message out to the people of Atlantic City so that you win this election? Well, you know, it, ultimately, you know, you have, say, on a good day in Atlantic City for an election, you're going to have 20, you know, 12,500 people that vote, you know. Mm -hmm. This year, we have six people running for mayor. You know, Marty Small likes to say it's a great day in Atlantic City. Well, if it was a great day with, in Atlantic City, you wouldn't have five people running against you for mayor. We have a, a number of independent Democrats, many of whom I'm friends with. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I know them. You know, they're good guys. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like I told um, 
Vince Mazio, and this is a funny story, you'll like this one, but I like to use this analogy because it's important, you know, that I was at a Vince yeah. Palestina fundraiser, right? I walked downstairs at Doc's Oyster House and I saw Vince Mazio's um, uh, campaign people over by the bar. They're kind of sniffing out, seeing who's there and how crowded it was. So I knew who they were. So I kind of walked over and they knew who I was. And I, 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 I came up to the bar and they said, how are you? I said, how are you? They said, you were upstairs? I'm like, of course. And they said, um, you know, how was it? I said, yeah, it was a, it was a Vince uh, Palestina fundraiser, very well attended. I said, I can't wait to see Vince Palestina smoke Mazio in the general. And the young lady snapped at me. She goes, Vince Mazio is a nice man. He's a good person. And I looked right at her, JR, and I said, you know, I said, my mother's a very nice person, too. She's lovely. But I wouldn't vote her for state Senate because she's not qualified either. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, people vote for somebody because of their personality or because they're yeah. just nice people. They're, they might not be knowledgeable. They might not be qualified. But put them in office. Let them, let them go at it. You know, I mean, come on. You're Too talking much. about very complex issues, multi-level, yes. trying to be preactive as, you know, or proactive as opposed to reactive. I mean, you know, and it, yeah. this is the problem in politics, not just in Atlantic City or New Jersey, but across the country. People are, yes. they, that's how they vote. The people need to hold their uh, elected representatives accountable, Tom. And that means that the people need to know what <clears throat> civics are, know that the role they play, and that important part of that role is to choose the right candidate. Now, we know that the Democrats are always going to look to special interests and look to uh, the unions. They're going to look to uh, different the racial uh, constructs. They're always going to look to manipulate some sort of special interest. But Republicans, constitutional Republicans, like ourselves, the Republican Party, we are the party of inclusivity of all. We believe in the 14th. We are the creators of the 14th Amendment, equal protection and application to the law for everyone. And that message, I believe, and as we go back to reintroducing, as Lincoln said, readopting the principles of the Declaration of Independence and constructing policy based upon those principles of the laws of nature, of the self-evident truth that all men are created equal, of the God-given unable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit, the pursuit of happiness, and then the consent of the governed, and to be able to explain to people what these principles are, they will resonate with the greatest number of voters. It's just our task to be able to successfully articulate that and make that register with the voter. That, and that's the challenge, you know, because people are so, so I don't, you know, I hate to use the word indoctrinated, but they're so indoctrinated yeah. with this, this idea, you know, like I've, I've had my students say, well, Mr. Forkin, when did the, when did it change? I'm like, what do you mean? Well, when did the Democrats become, you know, the, this, the party of civil rights and the Republicans become the racists? And I looked at her, I'm like, never. It's never happened. Yeah, it's just the right. perception that's out there and how some people teach or how, you know, how children learn or how some teachers teach U.S. history. I mean, they found a note, you know, that the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan happened after Johnson let the Confederate officers out of prison, that that started as a social club. And as soon as you got, as soon as they got out, they were all Southern Democrats and, and the Democrats like to say, well, they were Dixie Democrats. They were, you know, no, they were Democrats. And, you right. know, what was it? Strom Thurmond, wasn't he a Klan member? And that was one of Joe Biden's BFFs. I mean, come on. I mean, right. you, you Democrat can't, you time. can't make this stuff up. And, and, you know, they want to rewrite history and 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 put the, you know, the blame. And it's not about accountability, because if we're accountable for anything, it's for the successes of the civil rights movement that was advocated, yes. as you said, you know, um, you know, the 14th, uh, you know, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments are, you know, at yes. the hand of Thaddeus Stevens. I mean, if it wasn't for Thaddeus yeah. Stevens, I love the movie Lincoln. If people haven't seen the movie Lincoln, you need to watch it. I mean, it's it's a brilliant yeah. movie. I show it in class regularly, and uh, it is it is something. And that really 
that really happened. That's about as accurate a depiction as you could get, you know, um, for the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment that you could have. I mean, the arguments in the floor of the House of Representatives. I mean, that's that's spot on. That's exactly right. And Tom, what I like to talk about, too, uh, is that we are very we are in a political environment in this country um, that is very similar to the Civil War. Um, and yeah. one of those aspects, one evidence of that is the fact that the slave power, the aristocratic slave power, the southern uh, plantation owners, they primarily made up 2% of the overall population, but they controlled all of the politics of the South. And they were the ones that succeeded because of slavery. It had nothing, yep. like, they liked it, they, the, the, the lost causers liked to deflect and say, well, it was because of states' rights. No, it was because of slavery. And that, that's why they immediately objected to the uh, election of Abraham Lincoln, which has some parallels with the last election and people not accepting the result of it. But the point is, is that Lincoln that wasn't even on the ballot in the South. They didn't even put Lincoln on the ballot. Yeah, Talk about a rigged election. We're not even going to have him on the ballot. Right. No Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> of course, John Breckinridge, John Breckinridge, John Breckinridge, who became a Confederate general during the war, he was one of the uh, he was one of those on the ballot. And uh, but the point is, is that the two percent of the slave power is very, very similar to the owners of Google and to the owners of Amazon and to all of the big corporations that aren't affected. They actually th thrive because of the lockdown. And it is incumbent upon them to keep the lower class down where they are, and then that they continually to vote for them and keep them in power. And it's this vicious circle that goes around and around and around with today's slave power, if you will, being the major corporations, not Republicans. Republicans, now we're coming back to the middle class. The middle class is coming back to our party as it started with our party. But we still have now we have this modern day slave power that wants to keep everybody down economically and to use policies, progressive policies that cost more money and that re, and that take away the economic freedom of the people and the mobility, the economic mobility of the people to change and get better work. Yeah. I mean, social mobility is key, and the key to social mobility is education. And it doesn't necessarily yes. have to be academic education. It could be trade education, um, and, and that's key. And the Democrats have never been. I'm still at a miss at how, you know, my union, the NJEA, always endorses Democrats. I, I'm just amazed at that because they've decimated, you know, the educational system, especially in Atlantic City. They don't give a damn about the kids. And... Um, you know, when I called him out on it, you know, this uh, one of our former interim superintendents, I had a meeting with him because I was really lobbying the local community. And I told him, I said, Paul, it's egregious what's going on here. You need to step up because Tom, people in Trenton, this is what Spaventa said, don't care about the little black children in Atlantic City. And you know what I told him? I said, Paul, I said, that's your damn job. That's your job to make them care, yeah. you know, yeah. um, because we're losing our children. I've had Two students over the past like five months shot and killed in Atlantic City. Um, and that's heartbreaking. And, you know, they've started a memorial garden, Moose Garden on Back, Maryland. We have a yoga thing there tomorrow night. Um, you know, and, and it's um, some of the stuff that just goes on because the attention isn't being given to our children. We don't have the structured activity. We don't have a real game plan in Atlantic City. They just continue mm -hmm. to take, and that's where the violation of the Constitution takes place because it directly interferes with your with your ownership of property from your use and enjoyment of your peace and quiet. I mean, those are, you know, if you, if you just read the first article of the New Jersey Constitution, which is updated way more than uh, the federal constitution, but, you know, we have a right to be free and prosperous in the state of New yes. Jersey is the highest tax state in the United States. And people need to change that. The only way to change that is to start electing responsible, prudent um, elected officials and not, you know, professional politicians or some guy like Phil Murphy who worked on wall street and sold junk bonds. I mean, that's how we got in the recession back in, 
you know, originally in the first place, where are these junk bond guys, you know, guys like Murphy were, were spearheading that effort up on Wall Street. And then what do they do? They make them ambassador yeah. to Germany? I mean, come on. Yeah, he, he, he was, Phil Murphy was one of the uh, men who benefited from the stimulus packages and the bailouts and everything that and Wall Street and the bad investments and bad loan, bad financiers created on the backs of middle class America. Who has to pay for it? The Republican Party. We are the party of the middle class, and uh, we're reestablishing that. If you don't think of that, and you, you don't understand the analogy that I'm making with the slave power in today's uh, corporate uh, monopolies like Facebook and like Twitter and like uh, Google and Amazon and all the corporations that want to deliberately suppress our free speech and deliberately suppress uh, our uh, message, our Republican message, which goes back to the initial principles of the Declaration of Independence. It's not too easy uh, not to understand what is going on. And it's very similar to what happened uh, prior to the Civil War. Yeah, it, it, it's tragic what's going on in the country now. I have a number of my fellow veterans that are just sideways over what happened in Afghanistan. You know, the, the level of irresponsibility. And, you know, Biden fires back. Well, you know, it's uh, we had to get out of there sooner or later. Yeah, but not leave weapons that we're going to have to fight against at a later date, because that's, you know, that's a problem. And, you know, the Bush doctrine, you know, I agree with it. I mean, you know, do we fight them on their soil or do we fight them on ours? You know, we're not the ones that started this war on terrorism. They did. Um, You know, they started it by killing over 6000 civilian Americans on American soil. And, and here we are, we go over there, we occupy the terrorists on their own territory, and we're taking them out one by one, cell by cell. And uh, what does Biden do? He pulls us out of there and uh, leaves all of our weapons and assets there on the ground. Uh, it, it's, it's horrible. You know, I lost friends there as well. My brother retired a couple of years ago as a Marine Corps colonel, uh, highly decorated Colonel Keith Forkin. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just... It, it, it's very surreal, you know, what's going on in our country right now. And what I talk about, too, uh, Tom, is the fact that, you know, we go back to the Constitution. I always say that the Constitution is king. And the Constitution talks about the exclusive power of the Congress in Article um, 1, um, I believe it's clause, Section 1, Clause A, is gives the Congress, the United States Congress, the ability to declare war. The president doesn't do that. We haven't had a declaration of war constitutionally sound or authorized since June 8th of 1942, when we declared war on Estonia, Romania, and Bulgaria, I believe it was. Yeah. And uh, we have to be very careful. And of course, we have to hearken back to the father of our country, George Washington, when he said that we must, uh, we must avoid foreign entanglements. And what I believe is important is that the representatives in Congress have to realize before they're declaring war, and we've seen these presidents and all these other wars that have not been constitutionally authorized. But what the people need to do is to represent the people who will be going there and fighting better. We have to take into consideration the natural rights of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness of those we are asking to go over and forfeit those rights. It needs to be given much greater consideration. And that's why the Congress as a whole, all 436 members should be involved in deliberating and talking and debating before we send our people over there. We haven't done that since... Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president, and I think that that is a that we we need to restore the constitutional of integrity and define war for what it is. You know, Phil Murphy says we're at war with a disease. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt started it all with saying we're at war uh, with a depression, and then we have the war on terror, and we have the war on drugs, and these these are not wars. And you know this, being a veteran, unless you've heard that bullet zinging by your head, uh, you're not at war against these. Uh, th- these uh, mythological ideas. They're not actual war. We need to understand and we need to pass legislation that clearly defines what war is. And you know, as well as I, Tom, uh, war, there needs to be a, there needs to be an objective. There needs to be a way in which we say, this is how we win the war. 
And there's no question about it. And that was never realized in Afghanistan. It won't be in Iraq. Yeah. And this is why the Congress needs to reassert its constitutional authority, especially when it comes to war making. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more, JR. Now, let's talk about Atlantic City uh, as we wind down. Talk about um, how people can get involved, how they can uh, help you. Um, they're going to need to talk to their friends, their family, independent voters down there, rational Democrats. All Republicans need to get out and vote so that you can win this election in November. Well, you know, I, I think that the issues that plague Atlantic City really transcend um, partisan politics. I mean, you know, when yes. you look at, you know, the Democrats, I know a number of them, you know, have left the Democrat Party just based on what transpired in the last election, um, you know, for their primary. You know, uh, Tom Foley is a dear friend of mine. I thought Tom Foley would have been a wonderful candidate for the Democrats. But then again, you know, what do I know? Tulsi Gabbar, I thought would have been the best presidential candidate for the Democrats. But somehow, mm. you know, they these shill candidates that are, um, you know, they 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 pander to the special interest and they pander to the big money and they're controlled. Yes. You know, Marty's controlled, you know, by the state of New Jersey and New, uh, Atlantic City is going to continue to get fleeced. The people want to get involved with the campaign. You know, we have a social media presence, which is wonderful. We keep updating the content and that's Instagram at Fork and Four Mayor or um, on Facebook at Fork and Four AC. We also have a mm -hmm. website. Uh, Forkin for uh, AC on uh, dot com on uh, on the Internet. So, you know, people communicate yes. with us. We have an upwelling of grassroots support. But Jr. like my theory on 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 a campaign, I mean, a campaign is like a job interview. And I think that more, uh, yes. you know, elected officials or, or more people that are r actually running a campaign should actually really look at how um, how much money candidates take from special interests. You know, we don't do that. You know, my campaign last election cycle, we ran for mayor last year. And I say we because we have a team. It's a teamwork makes a dream work. Right. So we have, yeah. you know, our collective efforts. We we uh, spent a total of four thousand five hundred dollars. Four thousand five hundred. Now, mind you, hmm. Jeff Van Drew spent over one hundred thousand dollars in Atlantic City. And we got more votes than Jeff Van Drew in Atlantic City. I don't know how that's possible, but it happened. Um, you know, and, and we spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to beat us. One hundred and fifty thousand that, that Amy Kennedy gave them. And, you know, they're going to outspend us again this time, but we're going to outwork them. And, and that's really where, it, you know, the, the metal meets the meat, you know, where we need to get out and get the vote out, continue to meet, um, you know, uh, residents. You have. 17,800 people roughly that are registered to vote in Atlantic City out of a population of 40,000 people that could vote. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. And then out of the 17,800, maybe, just maybe on a good day, you'll have maybe 12,000 in the last election, you know, but the uh, some of the communities were highly motivated to come out and vote against President Trump because he was pictured or portrayed as a racist. And let's face it, his personality is a bit prickly. But the policies worked. You know, he had places in Atlantic City for many years, um, brought a lot of wonderful events to Atlantic City, invested heavy. Atlantic City thrived in the 1980s. Places were printing money. Um, but, you know, people forget their history. <laughs> they forget who who fed their families all those all those times, all yeah. those years. So, you know, the problem that happened in Atlantic City and, and I'll remind you of this because I ran many years ago as a state uh, assemblyman on the Democrat side. And, you know, I was going after a luxury room and parking tax then. Um, that didn't go well with my with my former Democrat brethren. I also mentioned the fact that they're going to have casinos in Pennsylvania and Delaware. People are like, no, nah, there's no way they're going to have casinos in Pennsylvania and Delaware. I'm like, Ed yeah. Rendell, he's a friend of mine, another fellow Villanova Law School graduate, told me yeah. at, at a uh, at a alumni function how he was going to do it. I'm like, the, you know, give Ed Rendell his due. He's a little, you know, crazy, but he's brilliant. And he got it done. They have yeah. gaming in Philadelphia. And I said, if you don't, and this is a constitutional issue for you, and this is the one thing, getting back to the Chris Christie thing that I agreed with, I told Jim Whalen when I was the attorney, I said, Jim, 
you know, back when Bill Bradley, a Democrat, came up with this goofy thing that says, oh, you can't have sports betting in Atlantic City because it's going to encourage the mob to come in. Mm-hmm. So my take on that yeah. was, well, that's unconstitutional. You can't do it. You can't afford, just like you can't afford an individual rights, you can't afford another individual. Everybody's going to be treated equally. Well, you you can't afford that luxury to Las Vegas or Nevada and not afford it mm-hmm. to put it out to the vote here in New Jersey. So Jim yeah. said, I don't want to rock the boat. You know, we could have had sports betting if we challenged it years ago on constitutional grounds. We could have had uh, uh, sports betting 25 years ago. It's unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. And the same thing, the on, same unconstitutional analysis is happening in Atlantic City against the people in Atlantic City, the residents being taxed out of their homes, the unconstitutional taking of Atlantic City, the unconstitutionality of the pilot program. Um, you know, it's just, it's all yeah. wrong. And people, there needs to yeah. be a sense of outrage in the community because their civil rights are being violated. Now, what what would I do if I was elected? Well, you know, we've held off on filing the federal lawsuit. We, we had it all set. The table was set. And we got hit with the pandemic about a year and a half ago. But we're holding off on it now because, you know, if Jack Cittarelli gets in, if Vince Palestina, you know, and his team get in, those legislative changes will be made. And the lawsuit mm-hmm. would become moot because then you have people that actually enforce the Constitution that are elected to office. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what we need in New Jersey. We need somebody that's because it's 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 above Murphy's pay grade. Yeah. You take an oath to enforce. I mean, let's look at what his statement was. The Constitution's above his pay grade. Is he out of his yeah. mind? Yeah. You take an oath, you well, hold your hand on a Bible to enforce the Constitution of the United States and the state of New Jersey, and yeah. it's above your paper. He should have just, I yeah. mean, how he's not impeached is beyond me. That's right, but as an ideological progressive, Tom, they don't believe that the Constitution is relevant anymore. And it gets yeah. back to what I was talking about the other night with the teachings of a one uh, Frank Johnson Goodenow in the late 19th century, a notorious progressive uh, who was good friends with Woodrow Wilson, who came up with the ideas of politics and administration to replace the separation of powers within the three branches of government, which they thought became obsolete or it was ineffective. We needed, they, the government needed to evolve, uh, taking a very Darwinian position on uh, how government but the founders understood that the nature of human beings, that we needed to have these checks and balances, as you well aware, I'm preaching to the choir, obviously, but the people can understand this. But Tom, in relation to what we're saying is the voter apathy within Atlantic City is very, very alarming. And this is what needs to be, this is what needs to be motivated, enthused these people still are the sovereigns within a democratic constitutional republic. It's not Steve Sweeney and Phil Murphy and all the Democrats. They still hold the authority, but they've allowed it to be taken for too long. They have an opportunity in Atlantic City with you running for mayor to get that back for themselves and you representing them and defending their natural rights through the mechanism of the Constitution and the state Constitution. And the local Atlantic City ordinances. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, we're educating them daily. And and I think that people have to understand how great things could be when you apply rules. And, and it's funny because my students at school sometimes will ask me, Ms. Morgan, why are we spending so much time on the Constitution? Because we do spend it a little bit more time in the constitution that maybe, but then when I give them the hypotheticals with the cases and the case law and, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson up to Brown versus board of education, Topeka, Kansas, right. you look at these cases. I mean, you know, come on. Thurgood Marshall was a Republican. I mean, you know, when you look mm-hmm. at the great Republican minds for civil rights that implemented these, I mean, it, it, there's equality, but you know we've been too quiet. I think, and again, that's the great thing about your your podcast and your your New Jersey Constitutional Republicans is that you know finally now we have somebody trumpeting you know the history here, the rich history of our party of Lincoln, and I think right. when we get back to those core values and focus on that message, that's starting to mm-hmm. resonate with people, and and I think that that is is pretty strong to maintain, you know, our equal way of rights 
for everyone, you know, and That's right. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna you know play the game of life in the United States and upward values, you know, we need to continue to teach and and p- more people watch your show, which is awesome. Well, Tom, it's been fantastic having you. I want to give you likewise an opportunity. I want I want to give you the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, the voters out there and tell them why it's imperative we've we've discussed it for an hour why it's imperative we could go on for more many more hours and and a lot of different uh, a lot of different subjects of why uh you're going to make a fine mayor but uh, tell the people let's get them motivated to get out there and vote on november the second well you know i think with all that said it's not just you know, it's not just about my campaign. I think it's, you know, right down column A all the way. Um, you know, the 18 diverse and dynamic ticket, you know, especially in District 2 and District 1 across the state of New Jersey with Jack Cittarelli at the top of the ticket. Uh, he's a very dynamic and engaging individual. He's a brilliant yes. person. He's a personal friend of mine and yours as well. Yep. And, That's you know, right. he... He is, he spends a a ton of time in South Jersey. You know, I'm just praying that our uh, friends up in North Jersey really kind of wake up and smell the coffee because, you know, Murphy's Law is not a way to run your state. I mean, Murphy's Law in Ireland, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. You reelect Bill Murphy, make him one and done in 21. As Jack would say, one and done in 21. No more Murphy's Law. I can't even believe he's Irish. You know, with those with those choppers, he must be. I think he's more British than anything. <laughs> I mean, come on, what I kind of Irishman it. closes bars on St. Patrick's Day? I mean, come on, this is uh, that, that, this is Phil Murphy. That, he closed that. down, you know, uh, small mom and pop businesses, restaurants, and and whatnot. And then they redirected federal funds to the uh, Atlantic City Convention Center. Um, and I think maybe they used a total of two beds when they had. To- People play into national and international uh, tragedies to kind of exacerbate resources and they set them aside and they come back and get them later like they just did. So, you know, getting back to the campaign, we need blanket change. We need people to understand that they need to become the spark that ignites change, not just in Atlantic City, but Atlantic County and the state of New Jersey. So, you know, I'm imploring people to go out participate in the process because our way of life, you know, our equality, you know, providing people opportunities, you know, the basic Republican principle on, okay, you can give a man a fish, you feed him for a night, you teach a man to fish, you're going to fit, you know, he's going to feed himself for the rest of his life. So we want to afford these opportunities to people. And when you look at the employment, the unemployment rate under the previous administration, um, you know, and I won't say his name because Democrats go sideways when they hear the T word. But when you look at those Republican policies, they just weren't President Trump's policies. Those were core Republican policies. Putting his personality aside, you know, those policies worked and they can work for the state of New Jersey if, if the people in New Jersey do the right thing and get that vote out for the Republican Party right down the line from Chitterelli right on down to... Uh, Jacino in Atlantic City. That's right. And you know, Tom uh, Jack is also a fellow admirer and mentor of Lincoln. And that is another uh, common denominator in our relationship that we love to talk about. But uh, Jack is a hard, hard worker. He's been all throughout the state. Yeah, he is. He's really, his campaign began the day that he lost the primary back in 17. And uh, he's been determined. He, he's gone to every single Republican organization. Um, we really look forward to who his candidacy and him winning. And I want to tell the people that I enjoy so much uh, your uh, your apropos or your ad hoc uh, posts on Facebook and and Instagram. You're running. You're 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 doing a marathon. You're running down the boardwalk. You're on the beach and you're giving. You're you're, you're having no problem articulating whatever thought it is that you want to bring out at the time. I'm so imp- I'm so impressed with that. But the people need to watch that, and we'll be providing the uh, we- the website uh, link uh, in this video. And I encourage the people to please like and share this video. We also have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the New Jersey Constitutional Republican YouTube channel. We have all of our virtual conversations with a whole array of outstanding guests we've had. 
and uh, none better than uh, Mr. Tom Forkin tonight. Now, Tom, as we finish up, tell the people what you'll be doing this weekend. Uh, this weekend, it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, well, we have some big hurricane surf coming up the coast. So hopefully right after school tomorrow, I'm going to paddle out to some uh, world-class surf right at the world-class surf break at States Avenue in Atlantic City. And then on uh, Sunday, we have the Atlantic City Ironman, the AC Ironman. Um, so if you're in or around Atlantic City, be careful. There's going to be a bit of a traffic jam up on the Atlantic City Expressway and uh, down Atlantic and Pacific Avenue because uh, – it is a 1.5 mile swim, a 56 mile bike, and then a 13.2 mile run um, at the end. So we'll see. Hopefully, I'm feeling this good uh, come Sunday. Right now, I'm tapering, so I lightened up in the workouts a little bit, um, trying to let my body kind of heal itself. But we'll see. It, it, it 50. I'm going to be 59 on um, September 21st. So hopefully, I'm feeling fine at 59 because I felt great at 58. So we'll see. <laughs> well, I'm right in back of you, but uh, I'll certainly be rooting very hard for you uh, on the on Sunday and uh, looking forward to the result. And all the best to you, Tom. Thank you so much for joining me. And as we conclude all of our broadcasts, let's remember that in speaking of the uh, creation of this democratic constitutional republic, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, all this is not the result of an accident. It has a philosophical cause without the Constitution and the Union, we could not have obtained the result. But even these are not the primary cause of our great prosperity. There is something back of these entwining itself more closely with the human heart. That something is the principle of liberty to all. The principle that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all unquote abraham lincoln thank you so much that's Tom. a great quote jr thank you for the opportunity god we'll bless have you take on care again and look forward to seeing you soon absolutely take care god bless thank you sir take care tom all the best